Thank you, Stephanie, and good morning and welcome to worship on this first Sunday in Lent here at the Presbyterian Church of Western Springs. We're glad to have you here with us. If you are worshiping online, welcome, and a reminder that our bulletin is available at presbyws.org worship. If you want to follow along with us, um, that would be wonderful. And also use the chat feature to say that you're there and to greet one another. That would be wonderful. A couple of, of things that we will celebrate communion today, and we're, we're going to uh, continue to use the pre-portioned communion, so if you didn't get one when you came in, you should do that. I also wanted to say thank you to Betty Banovic for preparing our communion bread this week, the one that I'll use for the breaking of the bread. 
I wanted to tell you, a couple people have asked, they've said, so we've done these Lenten challenges the past couple of years. Do we have a Lenten challenge this year? What are we, what are we doing? And your mission committee has been hard at work, and they're almost ready to formally announce our project. And I can tell you a little teaser that the project is going to last beyond Lent. It's not going to be just a, a short-term one. Um, and so hopefully by next week we'll have it all buttoned down, but we're trying to just connect with a few more folks because it's a, it's a little bit bigger of an endeavor than we've done recently, uh, and not just linked to raising money, but actually getting some volunteers in place to do some work, uh, working with some refugee programs. So um, there will be opportunity for you to get involved, and we're, we're just, like I said, almost there. So if, uh, if Kathy or I reach out to you uh, in this coming week before next Sunday even, um, don't be too shocked, and then we'll kind of, once we have a foundation of people uh, to help, we're going to launch into announcing it. Isn't that exciting? It's a little bit of a teaser. We're, we're easy, teasing it out a little bit. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is that in two weeks on the 20th, we're going to have our annual meeting of the congregation after worship. It'll be uh, right here in this place, and um, typically it's a pretty brief meeting because we, we break it into two and have our December meeting, so you'll want to stick around, and we'll have the annual report to share about the, the updates on the life of the church and our vision a little bit for going forward, so you want to be here then continued gratitude for our wearing of masks in church. We know the world is changing. It keeps changing, but uh, hopefully soon our session will meet in a couple of weeks or really a week and a half and, um, and be ready to kind of look at the updated numbers and all of the data coming out and make some decisions going forward. So um, just hold tight a little bit longer. We're almost there, I feel like, so that's a good thing. Um, I think that's all. We don't have too many announcements uh, today other than welcome. Thank you, Jim, who will be leading us uh, with the native flute uh, this morning, and uh, Cheryl, who is singing uh, for us today. Thank you. And of course, Kathy here, our liturgist. So uh, as we transition from getting here to being here, ready for worship, Jim will um, lead us in an introit and uh, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me <clears throat> in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. We gather in this Lenten season knowing we are broken. Come and be seen. We gather in this Lenten season knowing we need forgiveness. Come and be heard. We gather in this Lenten season knowing our hearts long for God. Come and be loved. We gather in this Lenten season knowing God calls us all. Come as you are. Oh. 
Friends, during this season of Lent, we are called to reflect on ways we can return to God. We do this through prayer, reflection, and confession. Let us confess our sins first in silence and then by joining in the responsive prayer. God, all too often we have turned from you and our love has failed. Our longing for glory has blinded us to the joy of your ways. Help us to choose the path that leads to life. We have turned aside and put our faith in things, in people, in institutions. We have placed our hope in the mortal, the tangible, the finite, rather than placing our hope in you. Help us to choose the path that leads to life. We have embraced hatred, sorrow, and anger instead of your life-giving love. We have sown seeds of discord rather than creating communities where love abounds. Help us to choose the path that leads to life. We long to turn our faces toward you, away from death and destruction. We long to be people of love, light, and grace, that we might be your beacons in a desperate world. Help us to choose the path that leads to life. Give us strength to glory in your creation, to celebrate the beauty and wonder you have made. Give us strength to reclaim the promise of Christ's life to claim the promise of Christ's love. Help us to choose the path that leads to life. Amen. The good news is that we are indeed accompanied on this journey by a God who loves us beyond our understanding. Let us seek to follow Christ. Amen. to God, let us also recognize that we have the gift of reconciling ourselves to one another by offering peace, peace that comes from God. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to those around you. Come on down. Come on down. Sharks or adults? Am I? There we go. What is it? It's a big fish. There's fish here too. All right, we got a couple more coming. Cool. 
So I wanted to talk about a couple of things today. One, I want to talk about this whole thing we got going on. So uh, you have to use your imagination a little bit, but this one you don't have to imagine. What is that big old thing? Yeah. It's like, what do we call that? A pot planter, right? And then what normally goes into a planter before that? Dirt. So that's what this brown is. So each week, we're going to talk a little bit about this because sometimes in our worship space, in our church, we try to change things up a little bit. We talked about this at Christmas time, at Advent, where we brought things in to help us think about things a little differently. And this one I want to just talk about because when we're in this time of what we call Lent, Lent is kind of guiding us to Easter. And what I want you to do is each week we're going to talk about what changes about what you see here. And this first step is talking about dirt, because dirt is where we put things to grow. And our hope is that during Lent, it can be a time where we grow, where we learn and we grow and we grow closer to God. And so we're kind of like the dirt. You're the dirt. I'm the dirt. And we're saying to God, okay, I don't know what it means always, or I don't fully understand what it means to grow and to grow closer to you, but use my dirt. Use me and help me to learn. All right? So that's the dirt. So you can go play in the dirt, and you can think about it too, about what does it mean to make things grow, and why is there some dirt where things grow and some dirt things don't grow? Okay. So next week, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Second thing. These are, well, what are these? Fish. And then what else are they? Can you tell? They're banks. Do you remember these at all? Anybody remember these? It's been a little while, huh? Yeah. And so these are another thing that I found out, I was looking at it today, for 70 years. And 70 years is a long time. There's some people out there who are 70 years old, but most of them are a lot younger. And um, <laughs> seven, for 70 years, churches like ours have been collecting coins and other money to help something called One Great Hour of Sharing. And the reason they call it that is because we, we collect all during this time of Lent. It's a helpful reminder to us. And then we'll bring them, and I think we're going to bring them on Palm Sunday. That's going to be the day we collect these. And on Palm Sunday, we'll bring these all back. And the money goes to help people who don't have things like food or shelter. Or when a disaster happens, uh, something bad happens, it's a way that the church says, all right, we're all connected to one another. We all help one another. So what I like about this is you, you're going to take one of these home, and you can color it like I colored this one, and you can color it in, and you can do it while it's assembled like this. It works okay. And you can have this little fish as a reminder every day, maybe to help with something around the house and get a few coins that you can use, and uh, maybe invite other people in the house or in your family to help give a little bit. And remember each day during this time of Lent that we can help people. Even if we don't understand, and we've talked about this with the big kids too in church, the, you know, older people, um, that even if we don't understand everything there is to know about God, what we can understand is how it feels to help someone and how it feels to be helped by other people. And so it's kind of our way we practice and we try to learn and understand who God is. That's one of the ways. Because Jesus did it. Jesus helped people. He gave people actual fish, uh, but he gave them other things that they needed in their lives. And so we can practice that too a little bit. So what I'm going to do is we're going to pray, and then you guys are going to go off to Sunday school, and on the way, I'm going to have you take the basket with you, and there are people <coughs> here who might also want a fish to take home and, uh, and fill during the month, so, and color in. So as you go down the aisle, I'll have one of you take the basket, and, uh, and you can see if folks want a fish on their way. I'll keep mine, though, because it's colored already. All right, let's, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, you get to take one, too. Sorry, that's a very important point. Yes, you can take one. You can each take one, and, um, and then you can see if other people would like them as well, okay? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this season of Lent and for giving us the ability to help other people. 
We ask your blessing on these fish and the love that they will help us show. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Frankie, do you want to take this? You guys can head off. Make sure you get a fish and see if others would like them on your way out. Our gospel lesson this morning is from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. This takes place right after the baptism of Jesus and before the start of his formal ministry. Listen for the word of God. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus, Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks this day for your word for us and pray that we might understand something in it for us this day and for the days to come. Amen. I want to talk a little bit about John Muir. Are you familiar with John Muir? John Muir is probably the most famous and influential naturalist in American history. He's certainly among them. His works and writings are responsible for such treasures as Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, and much of our knowledge about so many parts of our country, especially the places that particularly when he was writing in the late 1800s and the very early 1900s, these are places that most Americans had never seen or imagined, places like Alaska and the uh, remote parts of the Southwest and the West. Muir was once called the son of the wilderness, the son of the wilderness. The son of the wilderness wrote this invitation into the wilderness. Come to the woods, he wrote, for here is rest. There is no repose like that of the green deep woods. Sleep in forgetfulness of all ill. Of all the upness accessible to mortals, there is no upness comparable to the mountains. His words, especially words like this, this invitation, they're reflective and they're beautiful. It makes me, every time I read them, makes me want to go to these places that he describes. I, I resonate with what he says, how he describes it. And when I have experienced places of nature, I've connected in many ways with these words because there's something quite appealing about it, this invitation into the wilderness. There is no repose like it. There is no up upness comparable to it. Reading Muir's writings about nature is a wonderful and romantic experience, and it becomes even more so when you consider the wilderness about which he is writing. He writes about mountaintops, mountaintops that were known to be harsh, difficult landscapes, but he writes about them in a way that makes them pretty enticing, right? They're pretty inviting. He writes, keep close to nature's heart and break clear away once in a while and climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods. Wash your spirit clean, he writes. Or this one, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. In reading Muir's works, I began to wonder a little bit whether he was simply delusional, ignoring all of the harshness and difficulties of the wilderness. But this isn't the case, as all, case at all, and even though some of these works aren't as well known as others, he writes this as well. He writes, going to the woods is going home, for I suppose we came from the woods originally, but in some of nature's forests, the adventurous traveler seems a feeble, unwelcome creature, wild beasts and the weather trying to kill him, the rank, tangled vegetation armed with spears and stinging needles barring his way and making life a hard struggle. Muir recognized the untamedness of the wilderness. Even as he wrote things like, Oh, these vast, calm, measureless mountain days, days in whose light everything seems equally divine, opening a thousand windows to show us God. He also acknowledged the difficulty and the challenge that so many humans experience when they go into the wilderness. And so I wondered what drove Muir into the wilderness. Where did his sense of adventure come from his desire to see these new things connect in these new ways, and I didn't have to look very far. It turns out that Muir actually grew up in a very strict Calvinist family. I think it's interesting that the words of our last hymn were drawn from Calvin's, uh, Calvin's teaching and Calvin's words, beautiful words, but we know that in many Calvinist, strict Calvinist traditions, hmm, 
it can be a little difficult. He was born in Scotland, but he moved to Wisconsin with his family when he was quite young. And his family had a very harsh Calvinist father at the helm. Muir worked for his father, of course, from a young age on the family farm, and from a very early age, he spent hours and hours doing the wrong things, according to his father. He spent hours and hours also learning about animals and the land. His early years, he says, were spent navigating the punishments of his father and his explorations into nature and into books about religion and the outdoors. One biographer writes this about his father. He says, Daniel Muir was the harsh taskmaster, physical and moral, who believed that sweat and pain were the only means to achieve heaven, that acts of childhood and love of nature were synonymous with evil, and that both represented dangerous tendencies to be whipped out of a boy. A harsh landscape, indeed. In 1860, Muir went to the University of Wisconsin. Did you know that? I did not know that. He went to the University of Wisconsin and studied the writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And he began to follow their practices about writing about nature in an intimate, what, what became known as a conversational tone, a conversational way that connected the experiences of nature and the inward journey. It was in nature that Muir connected with God, that his religious upbringing with the God that his religious upbringing tried to introduce him to. I think that's interesting, that he, he had to get away from it to find God. It was in the wilderness and all that came with it, that the things that distracted, the things that, that drew him away from God fell away. They disappeared away. And so it was in the wilderness, stripped away from all those other things, that he found God. And in many ways, it seems counterintuitive that the wilderness can have and does have this impact. In the wilderness, our existence becomes so centrally about survival. Where will we sleep? How will we eat? And it seems that our individual needs would then predominate. That would become our focus. When the Spirit drew Jesus into the desert, there's nothing for him to eat. He doesn't eat. He doesn't eat for 40 days. And during those 40 days, our scripture says that indeed he was tempted that whole time. He was tempted by the devil. As Kathy said, Jesus had just been baptized. So if you've been following the past few weeks, we're going back. We're going back to the beginning. We had moved along with Jesus through those early periods. And now Luke's gospel is taking us back to the beginning well, the lectionary is taking us back to the beginning of Luke's gospel. He's just been baptized right after the baptism. Right after the baptism, the Spirit draws him into the wilderness, and there he's tempted by the devil. In biblical times, wilderness was not described the ways, in the ways that Muir describes the wild. Wilderness was seen as synonymous with a place of harshness, with a place of death, with a place of, of scarcity and loss. It's interesting because as I was thinking about this and reading about Muir's childhood, it seemed a lot more like wilderness from the Bible sounded like what he experienced in his home life, far more than what he experienced when he went out into the wild. Wilderness was seen as a harsh and desolate, pl desolate place, not a place one would go to find goodness. Wilderness was a place of loss, of death, of wandering for people, right, for people. Interestingly, for the animals living in the wilderness, even the wilderness of the Bible, there doesn't seem to be the same sense of inhabitability. This is a theme throughout creation, though, not just among animals and humans, but among us as well. The places, often the places most difficult for us are, are the habitats of others, of other people, people different from us. You see, wilderness has nuances and perspectives, and so does scarcity. Scarcity. For Jesus in the desert, being tempted in the wilderness, he's also experiencing scarcity. He's without food. He's famished, we heard in our text. He's famished. Jesus is tempted three times, three specific ways by Satan, in ways that look toward the coming passion of Jesus. This is part of why this text is used at the outset of Lent. 
First of all, Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days, right? An illusion or where we get our uh, 40 days of Lent from. But then also these three images, that, uh, these three temptations that come from, uh, come from Satan at the beginning of Jesus' ministry are going to then allude to things that will happen leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so we're starting, we're starting with Jesus at the beginning of his ministry in this moment of scarcity where he is without. And again, we'll journey with Jesus to the cross and the despair of his death. And so, yes, Jesus is experiencing scarcity in this moment. And this is why during Lent, we often talk of giving things up. You've heard of that for years, right? Of giving things up for Lent. Or trying to reduce distractions in our lives in the hopes that we would be left with nothing other than our reliance upon God. This is why fasting has been a part traditionally of the church's practice of Lent, or, or like I say, giving things up. I mentioned on Ash Wednesday that the focus on giving things up can actually sometimes be a distraction itself from God because people focus so much on that thing or activity or whatever it is that they're giving up that, that God's the last thing on their mind. That, that was never the intention. The intention was for it to be a spiritual act of, of uh, release of something so that you would have more room for God in your life. But uh, that's something you need to figure out individually of whether a practice like that is beneficial or not. But what happens here in our text is that Jesus enters the wilderness. He's drawn into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, and he chooses to fast. And when he's tempted and tested, his reliance upon God, his devotion to God, is what comes forth. That's what is revealed, and it's also what sustains him. There's a lot that just happened in what I said. First, he chooses the desert. He's, he's led by the Holy Spirit, but one foot in front of the other, he takes himself into the desert. He chooses to go. During Lent, every, every year during Lent, we're invited to choose to go into the wilderness, into the desert, to go into whatever our particular wilderness might be. Sometimes these are places we don't want to go. But sometimes, sometimes we're already there. Sometimes we're already feeling as though we are in the wilderness. We're so keenly aware of our wilderness journey that we don't need to be invited. We don't need to be taken there. We're already there. We're already living in the wilderness. We're already living in a place of harsh reality or challenging circumstances or unknownness or difficulty or pain. Like Muir on his father's farm and around the dinner table of scorn, our wilderness is sometimes as close to us as can be. In many ways, the past two years have been a wilderness that has sometimes felt suffocating behind the masks, locked in our homes, away from people we love. So much so that, that even folks who, who don't want to do those things focus so much on their anger related to them that they're in their own wilderness as well. It's, it's been a time of wilderness. For some of you, though, I know you've experienced also very different, very personal wildernesses, wildernesses of loss, of illness, of grief, of uncertainty. And even those wildernesses have been compounded because of the pandemic. But then we're watching every day on the news as a beautiful country with beautiful people made in the image of God is being ravaged, turning cities and towns into wilderness and sending the people of Ukraine into the streets with guns into bunkers and into a wandering wilderness of fear, loss, oppression, and death. Wilderness, my friends, wilderness, it's all around us. It's all around us. So yes, sometimes we don't have to choose to enter the wilderness. The second observation is that Jesus chooses scarcity in the desert. He could have found food to eat. He could have eaten. The devil even taunts him with it and says, create some food. You can do it. You're the God of the universe. 
But Jesus chooses scarcity. And again, this is, a, this is an invitation that the church traditionally has offered to people during Lent. This is why the sacrifices. It's interesting. There's a little bit of controversy in the Catholic Church right now because as much as Friday is meant to be a day of, of eating fish, right? No, no, not eating meat. The, a, a, Catholic, a, a Catholic leader came out and said, no lobster on Fridays because that's not sacrifice and that's not scarcity because some people, that was their answer was, well, let's, if we can't eat meat, let's eat lobster. I thought that was fantastic and it's kind of fun, but um, it made me want lobster. But, uh, but yes, this is why people sacrifice. Jesus chose scarcity when he went to the desert. Jesus fasted and so we too are invited to embrace scarcity. But friends, there are times in our lives, there are times in the lives of so many people, but there are times in your lives when you don't have to choose scarcity, when scarcity comes to you, when, when life already feels scarce. For many people, and again, I can't ignore the terror in Ukraine and the scarcity being experienced for the people of that country, but for many people, for many people, scarcity isn't a choice at all, it's a reality. Whether it's scarcity in the form of lack of resources or shelter, emotional scarcity or loneliness, the never quenched thirst for something that just doesn't seem to come, whatever that scarcity may be, it surely isn't a foreign feeling to us and there are times in life when we don't need to choose it, we already know it. And so instead, I offer that during this Lenten season, we recognize that wilderness and scarcity are realities of our lives. And they're not just reality of our lives, but they're realities of the lives of the people around us, the people with whom we're worshiping, but the people we don't even know. And while these realities of wilderness and scarcity may not be realities that you are experiencing right now, they are realities that you have and that you will experience. And they're realities that people you love are experiencing. And realities that people who are loved by God are experiencing, people you've never even met. The world is filled with wilderness and scarcity. But the places of wilderness and scarcity, before his ministry even begins, the places of wilderness and scarcity are the places where Jesus went, where Jesus is, where Jesus chose to go. The place where the Holy Spirit draws Jesus and where Jesus is able to resist all of these temptations, the temptations from a devil who knew, who knew exactly what Jesus wanted and needed, who offered to fix the scarcity and deliver Jesus from all the threats. And Jesus resisted these temptations and proclaimed his obedience, his obedience to God and his reliance upon God. Friends, whatever the wilderness of our life may be, God steps into that wilderness place. God steps into wilderness places. God steps into the scarcity. God steps into your wilderness. God is with you in the midst of your wilderness, and God reorders the realities of our wilderness and takes a place of temptation and threat, a place of fear and anxiety, a place of loss. God reorders our wilderness into a place of beauty, a place of infinite goodness beyond our comprehension. Being willing to recognize our wilderness, being willing to go into the wilderness, it stops being about sacrifice or, or doing something that seems harsh or sad or depriving. Really, it becomes stepping away from the harshness and into a place of rest, of renewal, stripping away the distractions so that we can allow God to do what God does best, love, create, care for, nurture, so that we can allow God to be God 
in our lives and allow ourselves to experience what God is waiting to bring us and to allow God to use us, to use us to walk alongside others in their wilderness, to choose like Jesus did, to step into that uncertain space, that uncertain wilderness, walk alongside others. Because that's even what Jesus did after he came out of the wilderness. When Jesus returns, his ministry begins, and it is a ministry over and over again of stepping into the wilderness of other people. He brings to people all of those things that the devil tries to give him in the desert. He feeds them. He gives them water. He ultimately goes to the cross for them, for us, in the ultimate act of protection and love and salvation. Jesus enters our wilderness, and he enters the wilderness of all who are suffering. During Lent, we welcome Jesus into our wilderness. And having encountered Jesus in our wilderness, we then follow Jesus where Jesus goes. We look for and see the suffering of the world. We don't turn a blind eye. We look for and see the ways that we can be bearers of love to a hurting world. We look for and see the eyes of the people that Christ sees. The ones where they are in their wilderness. I think Muir was drawn into the wild, not just to escape the harshness of his father's misguided attempts to understand God. Muir went into the wilderness because that's where he found and understood the God of Scripture, the God of the good news. Come to the woods, for here is rest. There is no repose like that of the deep green woods. Sleep in forgetfulness of all ill. Of all upness accessible to mortals, there is no upness comparable to the mountains. Friends, this Lent, may you experience God in your wilderness. May you find rest. May you be transformed by God's love for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Christ invites us to this table. Christ brings us to this table. This is Christ's table, not the table of this church or of any church, but the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a wonder indeed that we are welcomed at this table. For a long time, the, the church built fences around the table of Christ, meaning ways that you could come in to that table that you had to pass through. But, but Jesus says, let all who come, all who seek refuge in me come to this table. And so friends, let us proclaim the good news of Jesus in the great thanksgiving printed in our bulletin. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, O God, in this dry and weary land. You set a table for us in the wilderness and provide for all our needs. Even when we complain against you, you feed us with bread from heaven. When we quarrel and question your grace, you give us water from a stone. How can we keep silent? Even dry bones in the valley of death stand to sing your praise. We give you thanks and praise for Jesus, our way in the wilderness, our companion in the desert. He knows our hunger and thirst. He gives us the bread of life to eat and living water to drink. He leads us beside still water and prepares this table for us even in the presence of our enemies, the cup of blessing overflows. Now pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread, this cup, these people. By the power of your Spirit, breathe life into our dust and hope into our bones. Make us one flesh and one blood, one in the body of Christ. Let us live to sing your praise and show your love to all until our wilderness wandering is over and we feast with you forever in the land that you have promised. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, O God, now and always. Amen. Friends, on the night he was arrested, Jesus was, was gathered with his friends. He was gathered in a room set apart, knowing that what was soon to come would set into motion the end of his life, and the beginning of new life. But in that moment, he said to his friends, friends, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take. Oh, that's good bread, Betty. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Take and eat of it. And then he took the cup, and in the same way, after giving blessing, he said, this is my blood shed for you the sign of a new covenant, a covenant between your God and you, sealed in my blood. Take and drink of it. And whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. Friends, this is the good news of this feast. The good news of the one who brings us bread in the desert, who brings us water for our journey who steps into our wilderness with us and nourishes us. As we partake in communion today using the individual portions, I invite you to reflect on God's love for you and God stepping into the wilderness with you, even in the mystery of that, even in the unknownness of that. Welcome that unknownness, that, that wilderness that is our life of faith. Friends, the body and blood of Christ
Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this feast that you have prepared for us and for the way that we can be transformed by it. May we go into the world as ones who seek to find others in their wilderness like you did. But God, may we also be changed by your presence in our own. God, we pray for those in the world who are living in fear, those who are living in the fear of war, in the harm of war. We pray especially for those in Ukraine who are fleeing, for those who are working to bring about an end to the violence there, navigating the waters as tricky as they are. God, we pray for those who have the absolute ability to end this war and pray that they would have their hearts softened God, we pray for peace in our own neighborhoods, in our own city, our own country. We pray for peace in homes that feel like wilderness. We pray for all who are experiencing scarcity, emotional, physical, all forms of scarcity. God, I pray for each of us during this time of Lent that this would be a time of preparing our soil, a time of allowing you to grow something new as we seek to love others and love you more deeply and more fully. Amen. Friends, on Sundays during worship, part of our worship practice is to dedicate and receive the offerings of the church, and so we do that today. There are baskets in the back but we give thanks to God and to each of you for the ways that you give a portion of what you have so that we might continue in ministry and continue to love and serve God throughout the world. Friends, let us stand and sing together our closing hymn.
Friends, our time of worship has come to a close, but our time of praising God and being with God only begins now as we go from this place into our wildernesses, knowing that God goes with us wherever we go, wherever we are. Friends, let us go with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.